six Chicago startups state shaping the future of virtual reality. Now, please join me in welcoming Alec and Anejo to the CPL stage. Good evening. So how's everybody doing? Good. Good? How's the, how's the cold out there? <laughs> Chicago got, didn't get the memo that it's still fall, huh? So it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Anijo Matthew and I'm interviewing Alec Nawal Ali, who I met recently and just really, um, we, I, you can see I've been a little bit of, of an academic with the book, uh, making uh, references and post-it notes. And so I'm really curious to ask Alec a lot of questions about things that I read and also about Buckminster's Fuller's life. Uh, and through this, I think we can get to a point of reference by which you can start asking questions. So the hope is that we'll be in a little bit of conversation, but then we'll hand it over to you uh, to come up to the mic and ask questions. And we'd love to hear your thoughts, sir, about what you thought when you heard him speak. So uh, Alec, uh, let's start with a, you know, a really interesting question that we talked about. You start off the book by talking about Steve Jobs. Now Steve Jobs is like Buckminster Fuller in many ways. Tell us why you started with Steve Jobs. Uh, well, thanks, Anijo, and uh, thank you to the library, obviously. Uh, thanks for everyone who came out tonight, and thank you to our audience tuning in online. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So um, when I first proposed the book, uh, this is many years ago at this point. This would have been in 2018 when I first uh, went to uh, my publisher uh, with this idea. Um, I opened the proposal with the uh, commercial that Apple uh, aired called The Crazy Ones. All right, and this is a commercial that's, that's justifiably famous. It says, you know, here to the crazy ones, uh, you know, the ones who are crazy enough to change the world. And it, it's a montage of people from, you know, different walks of life, you know, different uh, fields and artists and people like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Picasso, Martin Luther King, uh, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, and uh, Buckminster Fuller appears during this commercial. And, and I always thought that was a great way to show his cultural impact, because I think in some ways he is the least recognizable person in that commercial. And a lot of people probably didn't even know who that was when they saw that, that ad for the first time. And so I said, okay, well, we can start here. This is a good way to illustrate you know, Fuller's impact on Apple. And for obvious reasons, I wanted to learn more about Fuller's um, interactions with the startup community with the community of people that ended up being the founders of Silicon Valley. And I began talking to people at Apple. And um, one of them told me to talk to a guy named uh, Daniel Kotke, who was Steve Jobs' roommate and one of the first employees of Apple, who was a Fuller fan. And I said, OK, that sounds good. So I, I, I called him up. And one of the first things he said to me was, so I guess you want to hear the story of how Fuller met Steve Jobs. And I said, I, I do want to hear that story. Because until that moment, I had not heard that the two of them had met. And no one had ever talked about this meeting, uh, which took place, I was able uh, you know, later to ascertain. Uh, it occurred on, um, I believe, uh, 1980. Fuller was brought to Apple uh, by a man named Taylor Barcroft, who I later spoke to, uh, who was trying to get a series of documentary TV programs off the ground and thought that a interview between Fuller and Steve Jobs would be a pretty good uh, pilot episode for this, this program. And so they just show up without an invitation. They, they show up at the Apple offices in Cupertino that day, and they, they essentially go to the receptionist and say, I've got Bucky Fuller here for Steve Jobs. And it actually works. Like, like uh, Taylor is able to get into the Apple offices. Uh, he films Jobs and Fuller you know, having a conversation. Um, because he knows that Steve Jobs is someone who admires Fuller. All right. um, Steve Jobs comes out of a uh, milieu in the early 70s in the Bay Area that is very influenced by Fuller's ideas, mostly through a book called The Whole Earth Catalog, which was kind of this oversized guide to books and tools for the counterculture that took Fuller essentially as its you know, inspiring guiding force. And so if you read the catalog, you encountered Fuller, his ideas, he, you encountered the dome, you know, and so he kind of, um, you know, through the catalog, uh, became the source of metaphors and, and ideas for these technologically minded people like Steve Jobs who would go on to found the computer industry in California. And so Barcroft accurately suspects that Steve Jobs would be interested in meeting Fuller. And so they, they have a conversation. At one point, the two of them go off together, and no one knows what they talked about when you know, they were talking in private. 
And then later on, they're leaving, and you know, uh, Barcroft asks Fuller, so, so what do you think? And, and he said that Fuller thought that the Apple II, the computer that uh, Apple was selling at the time, uh, was a toy. He, he did not think that uh, this computer could do the kind of work that he envisioned, because Fuller at that point had spent decades talking about computers and the potential for this technology to help allocate resources and help solve world problems, and he just didn't see it. He, he was not impressed. Uh, and to me, that story just said so much about Fuller himself. It said so much about Fuller's um, impact on that community of people and his legacy at Apple and at, you know, in, in Silicon Valley as a whole. Um, and I, you know, I always say, you know, this is a big book. It, it has, um, it covers a lot of ground and has a lot of good stories. And I chose to start it there for a reason. I, I wanted to, you know, reintroduce Fuller to an audience that maybe didn't know who he was, you know, was not aware of the influence that he had. And there is no better example of that than the story with Steve Jobs. Because even though they met for just one day, as far as I know, uh, to me that meeting sums up a lot of what makes Fuller so fascinating. Great, thanks. So how many architects or designers in the audience? Yeah, so most of us have heard about Fuller, right? Like I grew up learning about Fuller in school because of his work. Now I want to read a quote here. Um, this is his friend Alden Hatch who writes, apart from the temporary notari not notoriety of a few high government officials and some athletes like Muhammad Ali and Mark Spitz, Buckminster Fuller is probably the best known American in the world outside the United States. I thought it was fascinating that this is a, he created this persona, right? Like he himself made this up. Yes, so Hatch is, um, you know, maybe exaggerating a little bit here because he was uh, one of Fuller's friends. They actually went back for decades and, you know, he's, he's very uncritical, you know, he, he is a fan, you know, and his book is very admiring and not entirely reliable. But the fact that you could say with a straight face that Buckminster Fuller is the best known American in the world outside the United States um, is remarkable. And it, it does testify to, you know, the fact that you can make that claim and have it be even happily plausible at that point. And this is in the early 70s, all right? And, and you could actually say, you know, that Fuller was a global icon. And, and it's very hard to convey this now, because I think he has kind of fallen out of the conversation for a bit. But if you were a college student, especially in 1970, um, and you, you were especially like a certain kind of college student who was interested in, in technology, in design, in solving problems, especially, you know, in ways that um, kind of fell outside the activist approach. You know, you weren't maybe a member of the free speech movement in Berkeley, but you were interested in, you know, solar energy or in alternative construction methods. You know, Fuller was an iconic presence, you know, and even if you weren't, you know, that kind of person, you probably saw him speak. You probably saw him give lectures. You know, he, he gave hundreds of lectures every year at colleges and other venues throughout the world. And so he was a public figure. He was on the, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He, um, you know, was interviewed by Walter Cronkite. He appeared on television. He was lionized in the press. He received tons of awards and honorary degrees. Um, you know, Epcot Center at Disney World is clearly based on his ideas. And so, you know, he achieved this level of fame in his old age, you know, certainly after he was 60 years old and, you know, into his 70s and 80s, that is very hard to get your head around today. And, you know, and this is a time, you know, this is like late 60s, early 70s, when this figure of Fuller, and if you've ever seen him, you know, he is this, you know, older man uh, with, you know, a big bald head and, and, and glasses and a hearing aid and a black suit, you know, and, and he's on Hippie Hill in San Francisco, San Francisco talking to the hippies and like kind of, you know, engaging with the counterculture, with the yippies in ways that are, are really hard to comprehend now. And, and I think, you know, you have to kind of put your head back in a, in a time and a place where someone like Fuller could be this iconic celebrity, you know, where he was caricatured and parodied and appeared on talk shows. You know, you have to kind of understand, you know, his cultural impact before you can kind of come to terms with, you know, his story. But he created this out of this concept of, um, and you mentioned this word many times throughout the book, right? Ephemeralization. Mm -hmm. And it's critical to him, his own journey, but also his journey of his concepts and his work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So th this is a good question because 
you know, one challenge I have with this book is that most people who think of Fuller now picture him as he was during the period that we just talked about, right? They, they see this old man who's giving lectures and, you know, is talking about Spaceship Earth and all these big concepts, you know, and he seems to come out of nowhere, you know, like it's very hard to contextualize him um, and, and to kind of get, get beyond that um, image that people have. So, so to kind of go back in time, you have to see where he, these ideas came from. And these are ideas that Fuller was developing since the late 20s. So by the time he died, he'd spent half a century elaborating on these principles. And the big one, as you mentioned, is this idea of um, ephemeralization, which, which Fuller you know, um, comes up with in the early 30s, and it, he's still talking about you know, 50, 50 years later. Um, and, and it's a good entry point, you know, because, you know, it's important, you know, to kind of get at what was Fuller saying, you know, what was his message? What, what were the tools he was encouraging people to use to solve problems? And um, it comes down to this idea, for him anyway, of doing more with less. So the best way to start talking about this is to say that in the late 20s, Fuller's big idea revolved around housing. Um, he wanted to build a house that you could manufacturer on a mass scale in a factory and deliver anywhere in the country. This was kind of his big picture idea, which in some ways, you know, was, was very innovative for its time. Um, but to do this, he, he realized early on, you know, the house had to be light, okay, because you could not uh, build a house uh, that was the weight of a conventional house and transport it, you know, uh, in the way that he envisioned. Otherwise, he would overwhelm the national, you know, trucking system. And so instead of a house based on conventional compression materials, like concrete or brick, he designed a house that he called the Damaxian house uh, that was based on tension. So it was based on materials like aluminum and plastic and piano wire. And he arrives at these materials because he wants a house that is portable, that is you know, capable of being delivered anywhere. And so he kind of arrives at these ideas pragmatically. Like the house he has in mind wouldn't work unless he had, you know, this technology and these design solutions. And so for him, ephemeralization initially means, you know, efficiency. It means you can have a house, but instead of weighing, you know, 60, 70 tons, it weighs six tons or three tons. Um, and you do this by making better use of materials. So, you know, doing more with less. There's this moment in the book where you talk about him talking to the architect of the Chrysler Tower and asking the architect, how much does your building weigh? Yeah. Right. Yeah, every time Fuller, and, th and this is a question he asks of architects for decades, whenever he wants to kind of catch an architect off guard or maybe embarrass them a, a little bit, you know, he asks them, how much does your building weigh? And they, they never know the answer. And to him, this, you know, implies they have not thought through the materials problem, you know, how to use these materials efficiently. Um, but what I find really interesting is that sort of for Fuller, you know, you could say, okay, we're going to build this house that's lighter than usual, and it's going to use aluminum and plastic, and that makes sense. Fuller takes that even further, all right? He says that this is, a, this is a process that starts with compression, goes through tension, and then ends up in the visual, and finally, finally the abstract. And the end point of ephemeralization is that you can do everything with nothing. And in 1935, you know, this sounds crazy, right? This is a, this is a you know, it's, it sounds like a paradox, right? But, you know, you think about how the way technology works today, you think about Moore's Law, you think about the way computers and other devices have gotten smaller and lighter, you know, and um, rely on things like cloud computing, and, you know, and this is a trend that is real. Like, this is a trend that actually does affect technology. Things do get lighter and smaller and more abstract. And so Fuller, you know, he's onto something, right? This is an idea that I think ends up being incredibly powerful and instructive, that he kind of arrives at through, again, the very practical problem of trying to build this house that he has in mind. And eventually, you know, the house becomes the dome, which is, you know, much lighter, much simpler, can be built for much less, you know, and it has certain design shortcomings, you know, because he's not including, you know, the utilities and all these things that the first version of the house takes for granted. Um, and then the dome, uh, passes into geometry. You know, Fuller's major product line during the last two decades of his career is uh, geometry itself. And so he starts to lecture for hours with these models and these slides and eventually just words alone talking about this system of geometry that is sort of, you know, explains how the universe works, you know, that he calls synergetics. And the idea is that everything is getting lighter over time. And so if you look at Fuller's career, you know, he, he essentially ephemeralizes himself. You know, he starts as a guy who's trying to build a house in a factory, and by the end, he is a prophet. 
You know, he is a mystic. He's a guy who is talking to audiences, gesturing, you know, for hours uh, to, you know, these college kids. And it's become almost entirely abstracted, you know. And, and to me, that's interesting because this is, you know, he, he arrives at these tools that are kind of implicit in his work from the beginning. But then it's not until the late 40s, early 50s that he realizes this is how I can survive as a individual. You know, I can kind of build a career on these ideas and these images and these abstractions that will allow me to kind of keep myself in the public eye and get my message out there in ways that actually don't require building anything. You know, like toward the end, these ideas exist entirely as conceptual art. You know, they are, they are these beautiful drawings of domes over Manhattan or these like floating spheres, you know, that never really have a chance of getting built. But, you know, he has ephemeralized his operation to the point where that's all he needs. He, 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 all he wants to do is like, you know, get these ideas, you know, in the public conversation. And, and toward the end, you know, he applies the principle of ephemeralization to fuller himself. So basically, he is the first architect of the reality distortion field that... Yeah. Yeah, no, I use that term in the book, you know, I, I think it's fascinating, you know, I think, I think, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this later on, but, you know, Fuller, you know, originally he starts to try to build houses for real, and then he, he fails repeatedly, you know, he's not able to actually build the Damaxian house uh, at scale, like he builds some prototypes eventually, but he alienates his uh, partners, and, you know, by the late 40s, he has no real prospect of raising any money. Uh, you know, from conventional sources. And so he kind of ephemeralizes, he comes across this idea for the dome, that, which emerges kind of naturally from his interest in geometry. And, you know, the dome is a thing that he can build for almost nothing. You know, the dome, you can go to the hardware store and buy some sticks and some string and some wire and, and build a model or build a whole dome, you know, like for, for a few dollars. And you can build this uh, dome with college kids. You don't have to, like, start a company. You can just, um, you know, go to a seminar and lecture there and assign this, this design project for your students who will then come up with a dome, and then you can bring that idea to the next college on your list. And Fuller does this for, for years, you know, and so he, he creates this sort of virtual corporation, you know, this, this company that doesn't require, like, infrastructure, doesn't require, like, a fixed base of operations. It's just Fuller himself. And, you know, this is kind of, you know, bringing us full circle. This is how startup founders work. You know, this is, this is Fuller, you know, kind of embodying the startup ethos at its most pure because he doesn't actually build stuff. You know, he, he embodies the ideas. He excites people. He is charismatic in a way that we tend to associate with people like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, you know, figures like this who have this kind of messianic quality. And it's all for a reason, you know, Fuller is not just going around the world doing these things, you know, uh, because he's a genius. He's doing these things because he has decided that the best way to achieve his objectives is to become this kind of person. And we come back to the idea of the myth that he creates, you know, and so, I mean, a lot of this book is about trying to tease out the, the, tr the true story behind the myth that he, he makes and that other people enable. But, it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's for a reason. It's, it's, a, it's a tool that he uses to get things done in the real world. One of the colleges that he hits up against is the Institute of Design. This is why I'm here, is because he hits up against students at the Institute of Design, and Alec makes the claim that without the students at the Institute of Design, his geodesic dome may not have been possible. But we'll get into that on Wednesday. We'll talk about that a little later. But what I want to bring about it that, with that notion is he had this amazing relationship with Chicago, right, the city of Chicago, and he was here when these great thought leaders were here, right? There was um, Wright and Mies van der Rohe and Moholinaj and uh, Noguchi and all of these people were here at that time. Tell us a little bit about his relationship with Chicago. So Fuller comes to Chicago seriously for the first time in the early 20s. Um, so in, in 1922, he and his father-in-law start a company called Stockade, which is trying to build, um, it's sort of like an innovative building material that is like a fibrous block that you can stack up and then pour concrete down these holes in the middle. And it's apparently like a much more efficient way of building uh, like houses and other buildings, you know, than conventional materials, all right? And, and Fuller comes to Chicago because it's the center of the architectural world. You know, it, it's the city that had to rebuild itself after the fire and, um, you know, is a center for construction and for architecture. And it's an obvious place for someone like him to try to build this business. And so he ends up here for most of the 20s. 
And you know, Chicago is kind of where he has his first big insights because you know, the, the, the very short version of the story is that Stockade um, essentially fires him. You know, this is a company that he founded and you know, the, it's taken over by new management essentially and uh, Fuller is seen as erratic and is seen as someone who has been promising things he can't deliver and so he is let go. And in 1927, you know, he essentially feels suicidal. And, and the famous story here is that he actually walks to the edge of Lake Michigan, not too far from where we are right now, with the intention of um, committing suicide. And, you know, and again, this, this story has been mythologized, right? Because, you know, number one, this is not um, a precipice that he's going to leap off of. This is uh, him jumping into the, into the lake and swimming until he gets tired and drowns, all right? So this is not a practical means of suicide. So I don't know how seriously he really contemplated it, but I know, I know that this actually happened. I have a date that I think makes sense. I, I know where he was on that day. I think he probably did go to the lake and had this moment where he was feeling despondent. And according to Fuller, he has this insight where he says, you know, um, he asks himself, you know, what is my place in the universe? You know. What does God have in mind for me? And basically, he says to himself, you know, you do not belong to you. You belong to the universe. And your job here is to work out how you can be of greatest benefit to yourself and other men. And he says that this is the turning point of his whole life, that he, at that point, has been trying to succeed in fairly conventional ways. And now he's going to go off and try to become this person, this visionary figure that, you know, we kind of associate with the, the fuller of, of, you know, the popular imagination. And this is a Chicago story, right? This is a story that can only take place here because he, you know, Fuller claims that after this experience, he actually took a vow of silence, essentially, and didn't speak for two years. Uh, until he figured out what he wanted to say. But if you look at his diary, you know, he, he never stopped talking. You know, he, he had, you know, meetings every day with people in Chicago architecture, with people in construction, with people in design, you know, trying to spread these ideas. Because he, he was part of this world, you know, he was part of this community, uh, you know, part of this network of people that he was trying to reach. And, and, you know, he wouldn't have been able to succeed nearly as much if he had not been in Chicago at that point. Um, and this is the 20s, maybe in a bit, minute or two we can get to the late 40s when he comes back to Chicago uh, with you know, a plan that ends up succeeding much, uh, in a much more meaningful way than whatever he does you know, at this stage. So one of the things that's different about your book from previous biographies is you have painted him as a human being, right? You've actually broken, him, broken his life down into conceptual structures that make him. And one of the things that is a running theme throughout the book, which I found interesting and also quite um, uh, interesting to talk about, is his relationship with women, right? And he has an interesting, very um, different relationship with women throughout his life. Tell us a little bit about how that influenced him. Yeah, so this is a, an aspect of Fuller's life that no one had really written about. Okay, and I think a lot of people are a little bit um, surprised to discover that Fuller had an incredibly active uh, romantic life, you know, outside his marriage, all right? So he was married to his wife Anne in 1917, and they were married for almost uh, 66 years. So this is a long-term marriage, and it was, you know, a complicated relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think they were in love, uh, but Fuller certainly starting in the late 20s, you know, he has a series of girlfriends, all right? And you can ask, why is this relevant? You know, why is this, you know, important part of the story? So the way I see it is that Fuller, again, starting from the 20s, he very rarely has any kind of conventional company or, or operation as we would think, you know, someone like him would need. You know, he doesn't have an office necessarily. He has himself. And he's really coasting on his charisma. You know, he's an incredibly effective speaker. He's someone who has this personal magnetic presence that people respond to. And sometimes that takes the form of students. And so starting in the 20s, you know, he isn't teaching anywhere. He isn't affiliated with any kind of institution, but he's already gathering this circle of disciples, you know, these young men who are doing sketches for him and building models and developing these ideas. And um, another, you know, manifestation of that uh, impulse is in the woman. And the young woman that he ends up involved with, you know, th there is a romantic side to it, but there's also a side where these women are 
taking notes at his meetings and, le and lectures, and they are uh, helping him write his papers, and they are helping him, you know, like do these sketches or build models, you know, and, and they always they end up playing like an important role in his career. You know, these are um, creative partners. And I think at every stage in his career, up until the late 40s, he needs someone like that. He needs people around him who can kind of facilitate things and can, you know, help him execute, you know, these ideas. Um, and it's funny because these affairs, you know, there, there are a series of three or four important affairs that he has, and they kind of end in the late 40s. And what happens in 48 is that he finds college students. You know, he starts to lecture more. He starts to go to places like Black Mountain, uh, like ID, you know, and th these college kids end up taking the place of the women and the informal circle of uh, associates that he'd been developing beforehand. And there's always going to be like a kind of more anarchic, messy version of, you know, the, the college crowd that is off doing things for him, you know, in their own way, um, you know, outside any kind of conventional, you know, academic uh, structure. But you know, it, it is interesting that, that you know, after a certain point, it, there is no longer this romantic aspect to it. I mean, he is in his early 50s at this point. You know, maybe he's aging out of that phase in his life. But you know, there is a sense that the, the role that these women had filled is now being filled by his students instead. Well, you make the claim, and as most designers of this time, that without the women in his life, he probably wouldn't have become the Bucky Fuller that we know. Right, especially there were some very important women who influenced him, pushed him to become that person. And this is a story that we have heard many times with designers of that era, right? With Charles and Ray Eames and mm -hmm. uh, many of the other architects at that time. Uh, tell us a little bit about, let's say, Cynthia Lacey and her relationship with Fuller. Yeah, so so there are a lot of women in the story, and, and Cynthia Lacey, in some ways, apart from Anne, his wife, is maybe the most intriguing. Um, so this is a woman that he meets when he is working for the government during World War II, and originally she's his secretary, but he essentially kind of takes her on as a creative partner. You know, she, she kind of ghostwrites a lot of his essays, or at least collaborates with him on, you know, the papers he writes, you know, about economics and about design for the government. And then later on, they... Um, go to Wichita, Kansas, uh, because they get a, a, you know, they strike a deal with Beach Aircraft in Wichita to build a prototype of his Damaxian house. So this is the first time he's ever had a chance to uh, build this house for real, or at least a full-scale prototype. And he goes there, and Cynthia Lacey uh, comes with him, and his wife stays in, in New York, right? So, so for a period of like, you know, I would say almost two years, you know, he is living with Cynthia Lacey um, in Kansas, and they are collaborating. You know, they, they have a, you know, romantic relationship uh, as well. But, you know, she becomes a member of the company. You know, she is sort of there working with uh, management and, like, facilitating, you know, the administrative side in this, like, very active way. And then after the company implodes, in large part because of Fuller's issues with his partners, you know, the two of them are working to regain control of the company from the outside. And there's some amazing letters from Cynthia Lacey where she is saying, you know, in order to get these things to get things done, you're going to have to cooperate with people who you don't like. You're going to have to bring in other engineers. You're going to have to use people in ways that maybe you, you don't you don't want to. But you know you don't have a choice because right now you're seen as being hard to work with, and, and you're seen as being someone who people don't trust with the, with their capital. And you know she's being very pragmatic uh, in a way that Fuller himself you know was not always. Uh, you know, Fuller was not always great at business, and I think he relied on women like Cynthia Lacey to kind of help him with the practical side. Um, and, and the really interesting thing is that she disappears from his life story. She's never really mentioned in any of his, you know, uh, authorized uh, biographies or his accounts of his life. And this whole year that the two of them spend trying to get control of the company uh, also disappears. There's like a missing year in his uh, authorized biography that, again, is, it's all there in his papers. If you go back to Stanford and look at the archives, you know, there's tons of correspondence you know, that, that lays out very clearly this kind of, um, what I think is a very interesting story of these machinations as they're trying to get back in control of the company. But it's, it's kind of erased from uh, the narrative, because it doesn't fit with the picture that he's creating. You know, it doesn't fit with him personally. It doesn't fit with like this uh, idealized picture of him that he wants to, you know, transmit later on. And it doesn't really fit with this idea that Fuller was this um, kind of disinterested purveyor of 
ideas. You know, he, he, he is not simply out there trying out designs and experimenting. He is trying to take over this company again that he, he you know, resigned from in this like impulsive decision. And again, it's like, these are things that um, are not out of place when you think of him as an entrepreneur or as a startup founder. You know, these are things that are actually very understandable and very familiar to us when you think about similar figures you know, in the 20th century. But for Fuller, for a lot of reasons, he decided that this was not the narrative he wanted to convey. And so that's why someone like Cynthia Lacey, who plays a huge part in this book, you know, ends up being almost entirely removed from the narrative elsewhere. So as much as Fuller's life is about unsung heroes like Cynthia Lacey and the students at ID and all of those folks that helped him become who he is, he also hit up against some very famous people through his life. And I want to read a quote here, I mean, uh, read a statement from your book in which a secretary named Pat White sent Fuller a letter explaining that her employers were looking into a fabricated house they were wondering if you would be interested in designing one for them. The clients were John Lennon and Yoko Ono, right? And that's one. And then there's a moment in your book when you say George Nelson's famous uh, ball clock. He says that he doesn't remember who designed it because it came out of a night of like brainstorming with, uh, you know, designers like Fuller and other people together you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, there's all sorts of people that he hits up against. Tell us about his, the influence that these people had on him. Sure, well, let's talk about John Lennon, okay, because I haven't been asked about this before and no one's really talked about it. And I think it's really interesting. So um, if you go online and Google uh, the Beatles Day Out, there was a really famous series of photographs of the Beatles, just, you know, in London, and I forgot the, the exact year. And at one point you see them on a, a dome. It's, it's a geodesic dome, and they're kind of hanging out, they're kind of like goofing around and uh, you know, lying on top of the dome, and the photographer is you know, shooting them from the inside. And I was like, what the heck is this? And it turns out that Paul McCartney had installed a dome in his backyard in London, and it was, it was a meditation platform. Um, you know, I mean, I think he did other things there you know, besides meditate, uh, but you know, the, the, the Beatles were very much aware of Fuller. And, you know, it's not, and you're like, why would the Beatles know who this guy was? But it's because he was this figure who was well known in the counterculture, you know, starting in the mid 60s, you know, certainly, you know, he was someone who, if you were a, uh, you know, kind of a, a hip person, you would be aware of Fuller and his ideas. You know, he's someone who the hippies and, uh, you know, activists and artists, you know, were really intrigued by. You know, he, he was already 65, 70 at that point. Um, but they kind of adopted him as this grandfather figure who I guess they saw as a radical, as someone who was, you know, looking at the world's problems in different ways uh, than the establishment was. And again, this is, you know, the late 60s. Uh, this is a time of incredible, you know, social unrest. And people are asking, you know, are there other alternatives to the systems that we've been told, you know, need to exist? And some people take the path of activism. Um, others take the path of design, you know, and so people like, like Stuart Brand, who found the Whole Earth Catalog, um, people like the hippies of Drop City, which is a famous commune in Colorado that, you know, built a bunch of domes, you know, they're looking for uh, answers that maybe lie outside the established sphere of discourse at that point. Um, and so the fact that John Lennon and Noko Ono uh, at least are looking in a casual sense into uh, the possibility of building a dome house or some kind of like uh, alternative house, it's actually not surprising. I mean, it, it's, it, Fuller, you know, is the logical person that you would turn to if you were, uh, you know, John Lennon at that point in your career. Great, so at this point, I think it's a good time to ask the audience to ask questions. So the only thing that I ask is you come up to the mic so that the people in online can also hear you. So do you have any questions? Or if you'd like to maybe quickly share uh, your story, is that all right? Well, but do you want to come, come up, up here? To the mic, uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I, I heard him speak in 1969 in my college, and it was four hours long, it was a short one. And um, I kind of, I was very impressed and I became kind of obsessed with uh, his ideas. And in the 70s, I worked for Martha Graham uh, 
in New York and she was a friend of his. And um, we were going to expand the school, which was subsequently torn down in the 60s, early East 60s. And he, he came and gave a lecture to the, the dancers. And he spoke at that time, I think, two hours. And we were going to build a dome on the roof. And he never, we never had the financing. Eventually, it fell through. And that was my experience. But I've always been, I belong to the Buckminster Fuller uh, Institute in the West Coast when it was there and uh, anyway I was very impressed with him and he's, he's, to me he was one of the high points of my lecture experiences thank you and I'm going to read your book <laughs> wow I mean I actually have some questions for you um, yeah if you want to stick around afterward um, because I know about that project and I, I really tried to look into it because Noguchi uh, and Graham are you know obviously really interesting figures and I um, I looked for what I could in the archives, and, and there wasn't that much, you know, about that project, and I, I'd love to know more. There's also a reference to dance, and dance was very important to Fuller, right? Because there's this whole period at Institute of Design where he would talk to the students through dance, and the students would go like, who is this guy? Right? Like, why is he dancing in front of us? Yeah, no, he loved dancing. You know, like his, his daughter, uh, Allegra, said that, you know, his secret desire was to be a song and dance man. Um, and there is a Time magazine profile, I believe, from the early 30s that talks about Fuller doing the Lindy Hop at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. Um, and the reason this is interesting is that later on he designs this, um, it's sort of this uh, model of a uh, acousahedron that has flexible... Uh, joints. So this is a 20, this, this is a polyhedron with 20 triangular faces. And if you twist it, it collapses down into a different polyhedron called the uh, cuboctahedron. And then the, um, I'm going to get the sequence wrong, then the octahedron and the tetrahedron. And Fuller thinks this is, you know, an amazing discovery. And he calls it the jitterbug. And I think it's because this is the dance that he would have seen at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem in 1932. Uh, but yeah, and then later on, he, he's, you know, one detail about Fuller I didn't get a chance to include in the book that I love is that he would like, dance like an Irish jig, like whenever you asked him to. He would just like do it, you know, kind of, you know, on, on the slightest provocation. And he was dancing and singing, you know, he recorded um, some songs, I think in like the mid 70s, you know, when he was like almost 80 years old, uh, you know, of songs that he wrote uh, that talked about domes and talked about geometry, uh, you know. So yeah, he, there is this like kind of, um, I, I, you know, I mean, Fuller was a performer, you know, he was a charismatic guy, right? And he always loved talking to people, but there is an element of sort of this American type, almost like a, like a P.T. Barnum figure that I find, you know, really intriguing in Fuller's personality. Does anyone else have questions? I have a question, but first, uh, another point of connection maybe between John Lennon and Buckminster Fuller is, of course, I, if I recall, John Lennon and Yoko Ono lived next door to John Cage in Greenwich Village. Because if I remember, there was stories that Lennon would go next door and use Cage's telephone, because his was uh, bugged by the FBI. Um, wow. So that's another you know, point of connection, possibly. I wonder if... Maybe they got that apartment next to John Cage, like through Buckminster Fuller, or you know, some other connection or something. But there was a term you'd mentioned earlier, a reality distortion field, uh, in relation to Buckminster Fuller. I was wondering if you could say more. You, you also alluded to another conversation, but I was wondering if you could say something more about that. Thanks. Yeah, two things. Number one, yes, thanks for mentioning John Cage. Um, so John Cage, I think, mentored Yoko Ono, right? Like, they were very close. Um, and Cage and Fuller had met at Black Mountain College, North Carolina, in 1948. And they became really uh, good friends there. And yeah, they stayed in touch. I mean, Cage loved Fuller. And, and you know, this, this, is a, this is a smart guy, you know, and he thought that Fuller's ideas really were, you know, the answer, you know, like to a kind of way to create change outside politics. And so th that's a connection that I don't have a chance to talk about very often, um, which I find really interesting. Um, so reality distortion field is a phrase that is usually uh, applied to Steve Jobs. And I, I use that phrase for a reason. You know, the idea is that Steve Jobs sort of had this, had these goals, right, that um, 
he could only achieve by selectively editing reality, you know, kind of, kind of imposing his vision, uh, you know, on the world in a way that um, was not always uh, consistent with the facts. All right, and, and I think you know people use it uh, to describe the way he would demand things of his uh, his team of, the, of his associates, you know, in ways that um, you know I think in some ways were very uh, challenging and, and difficult for them. And with Fuller, you know, I use that phrase in, in, a, in a similar way. To me, the question is, how do you get things done in America in the 20th century? All right, and I think there's a certain type of man, and it's usually a man who is able to raise money and to get support from institutions. And it's often someone like this, all right? There are a lot of comparisons I can draw. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright is a good one. I think Walt Disney is a very interesting point of comparison. I think Jobs is a point of comparison. But there are these people who, you know, they kind of are able to create these visions and then draw people into them, all right? And then when you're done, you're like, what did he actually do? You know, like, it's unclear, you know, because Walt Disney, you know, he is not the animator. Steve Jobs is not the engineer. You know, uh, you ask what Fuller did, and you're like, well, he wasn't really an architect. You know, a lot of these designs didn't work. Um, you know, he relied on his associates and his students to, to actually do the engineering and to execute these buildings that end up with his name on them. And you're like, so what did he do? But it's like, you need people like this, for better or for worse, you know, these producers, these overseers, who, who kind of are able to get the ball rolling. You know, and, and I think there's something about our culture that is particularly receptive to these careers. Um, and and so, so when I say, you know, this is, you know, reality distortion field, this is a, uh, almost like a objective description of what people like this often have to do to achieve their goals. Yeah, um, you meant, just mentioned uh, Walt Disney and Frank Lloyd Wright, and I was that was going to be the basis of my question. Uh, essentially, two other messianic figures who uh, have Chicago connections. Um, but I guess my question is around his perception of those figures, and uh, you know, you mentioned building materials uh, with Wright. <laughs> or with Fuller, and I know that, you know, with uh, Wright and his Usonian programs and things of that nature, who cribbed who, what was Fuller's sort of perception of the credit that Frank Lloyd Wright was taking with those things, and then obviously with um, the Florida Project and what became EPCOT, obvi the, obvi you know, the, the, uh, the influence is obvious with Spaceship Earth, and uh, I was curious what Fuller's, um, perception was privately, since you were able to see a lot of that correspondence? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so two parts. Um, with Wright, you know, so, so this, is, this is interesting, because, you know, Wright is a generation older than Fuller, all right? And so when Fuller comes to Chicago, you know, he, you know, he sees Wright essentially as a role model, right? This is the most famous architect in America. Um, this is the kind of figure that Fuller wants to become. Uh, and then eventually he does meet Wright. You know, they, they initially meet, I would say, in the early 30s, and Wright respects Fuller. You know, they, um, at one point there is an invitation for Fuller and Noguchi to come teach at Taliesin, which never happens. And, uh, you know, they, they stay in touch. Wright reviews one of Fuller's books, and they meet occasionally. Um, Fuller claims that, you know, Wright asked him for advice on, on engineering, and then Wright describes Fuller as being, you know, his biggest fan. Um, and, and what I'm trying to get at here is that there is this ambivalence, right? These two men are friendly on the outside, but they are not entirely uh, at ease with each other because I think they, they were very similar figures, right? And I think they were both very used to being the most dominant figure in the room. I think Fuller, um, you know, occasionally accuses Wright essentially of stealing his ideas, as he often does with, with people like this, um, you know, and, and there's, yeah, there's this tension, right, um, and, and Fuller sometimes is very dismissive, you know, he, he talks about, you know, Wright's idea of, of building with nature is, you know, having a stream in your living room, um, and he, he makes it very clear that he sees himself as being a more, um, rigorous thinker than Wright in some ways, you know, someone who is operating at a different level than Wright. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is this interesting sense that Fuller admires Wright, but is also trying to um, transcend him or trying to, you know, make sure that he is never um, sucked into Wright's orbit uh, entirely. 
because Wright obviously is someone who tends to dominate the people around him and Fuller, you know, by the late 30s, you know, already has his own circle of followers. And Disney in some ways is even more interesting because uh, Fuller and, and Disney never, never actually meet. Um, what happens is that um, you know, Disney has this concept for what becomes Epcot Center, and originally in the mid-60s, he sees this not just as a theme park, but as a community. It would have like, people living there in this futuristic, you know, planned town that would have houses that in some ways were actually very similar to what Fuller envisioned for the, the Damaxian house. And then Disney dies, and those uh, ideas get shelved until the expansion of Disney World in the mid-70s, and they decide to have a thing called Future World, and from the earliest stages, the centerpiece is a dome, all right? This appears in like early sketches and models, and it evolves into this geodesic sphere that looks a lot like the uh, Montreal Expo dome that Fuller is credited with uh, designing. And it's called Spaceship Earth, which is Fuller's most famous metaphor. So clearly this, this ride, and it, it, it is a ride, is inspired by Fuller, um, but they never actually contact Fuller. You know, he finds out about this project after it's been in development for a while, purely by accident, because he is friends with uh, John Denver, the singer, who is actually at Disney to talk about a different uh, project entirely, and happens to see the conceptual art for Future World. He's like, oh, this looks like a Fuller dome. And so he tells Fuller, and Fuller gets this belated invitation to meet with the Imagineers in Glendale for like one day. And so he comes in and gives a lecture and they talk for a little bit. But it's really clear that they have no intention of involving him in any kind of meaningful way. And Fuller is mad. You know, once, once Spaceship Earth goes up, he complains that, you know, they took his ideas, didn't give him proper credit. And they still don't. You know, there, there's no mention of Fuller in any official Disney materials. But it's manifestly based on his work. And to me, this is so interesting because Fuller is someone who is obsessed by control. He wants to always sort of be in charge and, you know, prevent people from taking his ideas. But at the end, you know, he was so famous and these ideas had, were so widely, you know, disseminated that the Disney Imagineers thought that they could treat them essentially as though they were in the public domain. And so to me, it's both a reflection of Fuller's ultimate triumph, uh, you know, because he did become this cultural figure, you know, at the end of his life, but also his, his failure to remain in control, uh, remain, remain in control in the way that he wanted. So uh, what's really uh, interesting about what you just said is that this idea that Fuller didn't fully own his, his concepts. And of course, you know, the geodesic dome was also being experimented in other parts of the country and around the world when Fuller revealed it. I want to read a quote, but what's fascinating to me is that Fuller always lived in the future. Is that right? I mean, like, there's this whole idea of him being in the future. So this is a quote. Uh, because I live in the frontiers, Fuller said, what happens to me usually happens to others later on. Which is super fascinating, right? And in, in some sense, the dome over Manhattan, or this idea that we live in an electromagnetic world. He was prescient. He, he really thought about these things. And maybe by mistake or by accident, but it was something that did come true. Yeah, I mean, I want to make it very clear that I'm a Fuller fan, all right? I spend a lot of this talk and a lot of the book, you know, kind of trying to debunk certain myths around Fuller, but, you know, I do think he was an extraordinary man, and he took huge risks, you know, as a thinker and as a person um, that I think are a big part of the reason why he was this complicated person. You know, I think he... Um, you know, he was not the idealized figure that we tend to imagine or that his fans like to imagine, but it's because, you know, to survive and to kind of do the things that he did it required a certain discipline and a certain kind of pragmatism and even ruthlessness that, you know, we, again, you know, you look at people like Disney or like Wright, you know, th these, are, these are attributes that we see over and over again. And, and I think that uh, to tell Fuller's story in its entirety, you know, it's more useful than the sort of um, uncritical picture that previous biographies have tended to present. Because I do think that his life is an incredible case study. I think that if you're a young person who's trying to achieve change, you know, that there are all kinds of lessons, you know, from Fuller that you can use uh, profitably. But only if you understand the consequences, you know, understand the costs of, you know, becoming a person like this. So on that note, what are you working on in the future? <laughs> So um, I don't have a uh, good answer for that question. I do have some ideas um, for the next book. I, I will say that this figure 
uh, for whatever reason, I keep being drawn to people like this. You know, my, my first book was called Astounding, and it was about um, the history of science fiction in America, you know, during like what's called the Golden Age. And it includes people like L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who was a, you know, a, a very important science fiction writer who later went on to found Scientology. And uh, you know, Fuller, you know, he is not like Hubbard, right? I think Fuller was a genius in ways that Hubbard was not. Um, but you know, they, they, they achieved their goals in some other ways. I, I think there are you know, connections there that, that are interesting. And I think if there's like one theme in my career as a writer, it's that I find these kinds of people very instructive. And I think that these people have had a huge impact on our lives and on the culture that we live in. And I think it's actually very useful to try to like look back at these stories and try to figure out you know, what they did and how and, and why. Right. So as we end the conversation, I want to point out that along with the book signing, there are also some um, manuscripts, a small excerpt from Alex's book, and it points out the Institute of Design's relationship with Fuller, or Fuller's relationship with the students at Institute of Design. I, it's completely free. Please feel free to take it with you. On Wednesday, this Wednesday, September 19th, Alec is going to be at the Institute of Design to talk about that part of Fuller's life. And it is our 85th anniversary, so I welcome everybody in the audience and everybody online to come to the Institute of Design and be part of the celebrations and hear more about how the Institute of Design influenced the world. Um, please check us out uh, on id.iit.edu and the information is all there and we'll continue the conversation at that time, Alec. Um, so with this, I think we're gonna conclude the talk. Um, thank you to Chicago Public Library and Harold Washington Library for hosting this and thanks to all of you for turning up on what is what looks like a day out of Game of Thrones uh, and uh, thank you to Alec for uh, indulging us with all, the, all of these stories and uh, ideas. Oh, thank you, it was my pleasure. <laughs>